See, accepting God's free gift involves so much more than mere mental or emotional assent. It is life-changing. Well, hello. Welcome to the Simple Not Shallow podcast, where the coffee is good and the conversation is even better. Hmm. Oh, this is going to be a good chat. And what we're talking about this episode is the possibility of losing our salvation. And before we begin, I do want to take a moment to thank Eno Chicago for suggesting such a beautiful topic. Pretty big topic, but quite lovely and quite important, I think. And, you know, if you have a topic that you would like for us to chat about, well, let me know in the comments section. Now, just to let you know, I have had a couple more suggestions for upcoming chats, but your suggestion will take its place in the queue, and we'll get to it. Thank you. Now... As I began to prepare for this chat, well, I knew that it was going to be a challenging topic. But what I wasn't expecting was to find just how incendiary this topic has become. I mean, there is so much vitriol and venom being spewed by each side at the other, right? And this is done with so much condescending arrogance toward the opposing view. You know, and, 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 and all of that is coming from people who claim to be Christian. That is beyond unfortunate. It's beyond distressing. It is actually quite tragic. I mean, well, how is Jesus' prayer of our all being one as he and the Father are one ever going to be answered if we keep dividing ourselves and being angry with each other because we disagree? Well, having said that, we are going to do what we always do here, and that is look at this through the lens of what it means to be a Christian which is a following of Jesus, right, that involves a relationship, first and foremost, leading to a studentship, leading immediately to a life lived from everything that is learned. All three, all at once, all together. Never one of these in isolation from the rest. They are all intrinsically linked. And yes, I am going to list all the scripture that I reference in the description area so you can check them out for yourself. Okay, so in contemplating all of this, I was left trying to decide where exactly should we begin. Well, I tell you what, let's start with a point of agreement. You know, I mentioned all the disagreement and, ven and venom, right? But there is one point of agreement in this, in everyone that I found, well, in all the sources that I was able to check into. And that is found in the statement in the book of John, John chapter 10, verse 29. This is where Jesus says that no one can snatch us out of the Father's hand. See, everyone agrees that we cannot be taken from the Father's hand. But the sharp disagreement arises over the question of whether we can remove ourselves from our Father's hand you know, give up our salvation. And, and, and yes, each side can and does whip out a list of Bible passages to support its side of the argument. And each tend to ignore those passages the other side uses for support. Or, you know, when each side uses the same passage, well... I have found that each side claims that the other is the one misunderstanding and misusing that passage. 
So, you know, where do we go for help in this? Well, let's go back to our definition of Christianity. A following of Jesus that involves a relationship leading to studentship, leading to a life lived from everything learned. See, I find that this takes us below the surface of mere religious ideas and can actually help us see what this is all about. Now, in our last chat, and I will link to that in the description area as well, well, we talked about how being saved actually involves believing in Jesus. Not believing things about him, but believing in him. And how this actually involved accepting him as Lord of our lives, right? Then we also discussed that when we did this, we actually were born of God. We became his children at that point. And when we did that, that is when we passed from death unto life through that relationship with him. And, well, in preparing for this chat, I even found a, a passage where Paul, and, and this is in 2 Corinthians, where he clarifies things a little bit more for us, okay? In this passage, he says that if anyone is in Christ, well, he is a new creature. Old things passed away. All things are indeed new. See, when we truly sincerely and authentically choose to believe in Jesus, you know, to rely on him, to trust in him, and to cling to him, something happens on the inside of us. We are not who we once were. See, something new has been made in us. And, and yes, we have to still grow into this new creation, I mean, we will still struggle with our old selfish nature and with temptations and sin. Yes, yes, we will. And yet, we are not as we once were. A change has indeed been made. So, well, a natural question arises from this. Are we equal to God in such a way that we can uncreate this new creature that he has created in us? I know I'm not. Ooh, and here is another idea. And it also brings up a serious question. See, at the moment we believe in Jesus, we are told that by this faith, we are justified. Now, this is a judicial term describing a judicial act. It is the declaring of a verdict of acquittal, and so excluding all possibility of condemnation, right? It is not a process. It is a once done, once declared, and then it's over, right? See, it is not that we will be justified. It is not that we are being justified, but it is that we have been justified, full stop. Now, here's the question that comes from all that. See, since God knows all things, right? And so he knows who will truly believe in him until the very end, and who will not. Well, does it make any sense that he would declare somebody justified, knowing ahead of time that that person will later walk away from him and no longer believe? Hmm, that doesn't make sense. Oh, and here's another question. Assuming, for the point of argument, that a true believer can indeed choose to no longer believe, well... If it took an act of God for us to be judged, justified, to be acquitted, are we superior to God? 
I mean, are we the Supreme Court to God's lower court so that we can overturn his verdict? Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I don't think so. Do you? Now, here's something interesting. Even those who think that salvation can be given up do not think that this can happen after death, you know, after a person has gone home to be with the Lord. See, something has changed at that point uh, to make this other than a possibility. Now, here's the question from that. When does that change actually take place? Well, let me offer this for your consideration. Since justification is not a process, it is not contingent on anything we can do or not do. You know, we only accept the free gift that Jesus offers, right? And as it is done once and for all, Well then, it seems a little logical that the change happens at the moment we believe in Jesus and accept him as Lord. For that is when we are justified. Now, because of this, and you know, because of all we know about what is involved in accepting Jesus' gift of eternal life, you know, well in light of that and everything we've talked about. I'm going to take John chapter 6, verse 38 through 40, at face value. Now this says, and it's Jesus talking, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given to me, but raise them up on the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will indeed raise him up on the last day. And you know, even if it were to be ourselves who took ourselves out of salvation and out of that relationship, well, that would be a loss, would it not? And Jesus just said he would lose none, correct? So, that leaves me nowhere to go but to say no. We cannot lose our salvation. See, accepting God's free gift involves so much more than mere mental or emotional assent. It is life-changing in more ways than one. Now, well, I thought about maybe making this two different videos, but I just because of length, but I think I think I really do need to continue and take a moment to briefly address a couple of objections to not losing our salvation that I encountered while preparing for this episode. I, I think they need, these two things need to be presented together. And please note, I am not saying, and this cannot be, an all-inclusive handling of these objections. The time allowed for this chat and the size of my coffee cup just make it impossible for me to do all that. But I do hope this will give you a good footing from which to explore this further. Okay, so the first objection we'll mention is that, you know, people will just use the inability to lose their salvation as an excuse to live however they want. You know, saying things like, well, If I can't lose my salvation, then I can do and live however I want. I mean, it doesn't matter anyway. I'm going to heaven. I'm done. Well, my first response to that is that that is an abuse of a truth. And an abuse 
does not make the truth false. The abuse is what is false, not the truth. And the second thing that occurs to me, well, in those saying this type of stuff, is that they are not true followers of Christ to begin with. I mean, you simply can't be in a relationship with Jesus, learning from him and living out what you learn, and yet also live in ways that take no account of him or what he teaches. Indeed, in 1 John chapter 2, Paul, uh, John calls such people liars. John says they're lying to you if this is what they do. Paul also deals with this in Romans chapter 6. Now, this is where he says, Are we to continue in sin that grace may increase? <sighs> Negatory, Batman. Negatory. Hmm. Okay. Okay, negatory Batman was my paraphrase. It's not exactly the words he uses, but it is the essence of what he says. Now, another objection, you know, is that folks leave Christianity and the church all the time. So, aren't they giving up their salvation? Well, 1 John chapter 2 also addresses this and says something really profound. John says, They went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For, you know, if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going out does show that none of them belonged to us. You know, so while they are indeed good people, you know, they're very sweet people, and they can be very religious people. They do not have a personal relationship with Jesus. So, no, they are not giving up something which they really never had. Indeed, according to John that we just looked at, their leaving is truly proof that they never had it at all. Well, and, 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 and two, you know, remember the judgment of the sheep and the goats in Matthew chapter 25? This also shows that there will be those in the church who look right, who do the right things, but who do not believe in Jesus. I mean, the church does have folks attending it who have no relationship with Jesus whatsoever. You know, and so when they leave, while they are leaving religious things, they are not leaving what they did not have, which is a relationship with Jesus, which, as we have seen, is what salvation is. Now, yes, 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 I am aware we're getting a little bit long, but there is one other type of objection that I truly need to mention. Now, this concerns what is known as the warning passages, okay? Passages that seem to warn that, you know, if you don't mind your P's and Q's, you will lose your salvation. With a main uh, warning passage being found in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 through 8, and specifically verses 4 through 6. And I must say that I am very grateful to a Dr. Leighton Flowers and a Dr. David Allen for their insight into this passage. And yes, I will leave a link, leave a link, wow, I will leave a link to the video where they discuss this in the description area so you can go watch it yourself. Now, one of their main points, I will let you know though, is that scripture in its context must help us interpret scripture. For instance, here, they explain that verses 4 through 6 must be seen in the context of all the verses of 1 through 8. That's very insightful. Well, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1, it says, Let's leave elementary teaching about Christ, let's leave it behind, and press on to maturity. You know, not laying again the foundation of repentance, you know this, from dead works and from faith toward God. And then verse 3 says something very interesting. It says, and this we will do 
if God permits. See, these verses set up the groundwork for the rest of this passage. It's all about growing and maturing in Christ. You know, not staying spiritual infants, but learning to live out all aspects of this relationship. All right. Well, like I said, I am getting a little bit long, so I don't have the time to expound further upon any of that. But let me suggest again Dr. Flowers and Dr. Allen's video. They spend over an hour and a half, I think it's really more closely to hour 45 minutes, talking about this. Now, do check out this video, for not only is it very interesting and informative, it is very conversational. And there is nothing but respect offered for views that are different from their own. There's no vitriol, no venom, but respect. And this contains well-thought-out explanations. I mean, they take you through the thought process so you know exactly how they're arriving at what they arrive at. And there is no name-calling, no insult-slinging, no vitriol, which I found very refreshing. And also, strength for their argument. Well, Using this same insight, I turned to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, which is where Paul says that you know he disciplines his body so that after preaching to others, he will not be disqualified. Now, I have heard this as a warning. I've heard about this as a warning passage about being disqualified from salvation, haven't you? But as I went back over the entire chapter, to look at the context, I found that in verse 18, he mentions the reward he receives for all that he does, right? He says, it is just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge and so not make full use of my rights as a preacher of the gospel. That is his reward. And in verse 23, he says that he does everything that he does for the sake of the gospel, that he might share in its blessings. See, he is rewarded by keeping his preaching free, free of charge, and he doesn't want to miss out on the blessings of the gospel. See, those in the context of this chapter make absolute sense as to the things that he doesn't want to be disqualified from. Context is an amazing thing. And so, I do not find these to be warnings about losing salvation, but rather, I have come to see that they are warnings about losing out on blessings, maturity, on a closeness with God that only comes from growing in maturity with Him. It's an amazing thing. Now, Yes, much, 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 much more could be said about all this. I mean, most of the videos that I checked out on this topic tend to be over an hour long, and they don't repeat themselves on anything. But I do think this gives us a good biblical grounding for understanding that we cannot lose our salvation with God. We can't give it up. We're done. We're, we're, we're in the pocket. We're good. Now, well, I'll tell you what, let me know what you think about it. But please, and I've never said this in any other video, but I'm really stressing it now, please keep it civil. And, and I'm very serious about that. I encountered too much name calling and insult slinging and condescending arrogance from people who were professing to be Christians. You know, rather than serious, respectful, and engaging disagreements. See, I'm over the slurs. I will not respond to them, and I will delete such comments, just giving you a heads up. Now, do disagree if you disagree, because you can disagree and be respectful and share why you disagree. I mean, when you share the why, you know, say I found this, this, and this passage to say things a little different. Have you considered this point of view? What about this over here? This is why I think you're mistaken. 
See, when you do that, we can reason together. I mean, truly, honestly, we may never agree. But we can grow together in love for each other. More along the way of becoming one in answer to Jesus' prayer. You know, for we can know where each one's coming from. That's a good thing. Also, thanks to Eno. I do hope that this has been helpful, that it's addressed everything you wanted me to address. If not, let me know. I'll be glad to address specifically what you are asking about. But again, thank you so much for this wonderful topic. Well then, until next time, may you grow stronger in your relationship with God through Jesus under the guidance and teaching of the Holy Spirit. And, you know, take it easy. Take it slow and make coffee into your cup always flow.